uh, it comes up with a solution that I devised, which is to use the extract by mast function to get the right answer. But in parallel with this, uh, Dr. Maidman and I were corresponding with a person at Esri, and he points out that he says this solution is not the optimal, and he actually suggests a different, more complicated solution, which I didn't get a chance to put into a handout. But I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to my email here. So this is the email from Charlie Fry, which he says, uh, he explains that the larger cell count and the further the rot is from the equator, the worse using cell count will become. And he's suggesting uh, not to use extract by mask, but to use the raster to polygon, and then to effectively work with uh, that as uh, projected data. So those are sort of four important but fairly technical steps uh, to do that. And then he's got a, a link to work that he showed at, um, at an AAG meeting. And then there was uh, additional correspondence. I had some questions from him, and uh, he uh, replied. Um, and then Dr. Maidman has uh, edited the, um, the exercise script. Yes, so, so I. Uh, Maidman, the bottom line is it's complicated. Yeah, Go well, <laughs> I, so I looked into Charlie's solution. Charlie's a cartographer at Esri, and he works with the team that builds the, um, the Living Atlas data. So I started corresponding with him to make sure that we know what we're doing here. And uh, he's got a complex solution. I looked through it, and my eyes started to glaze over. So I uh, checked Dr. Tarberton's solution, and it works. And so um, if you could just open up that the exercise to... The, in the e email that you just so this one, yeah, yeah that one there yeah so I've just corrected the uh, script for exercise two to add the correction that Dr Tarberton so if you can go down to the part where it deals with the the land cover selection any other word yeah a bit past that yeah yeah you got to make the basin first and then. There we go. So yeah, just here. So this one small. So if you, do, if you use extract by mask here, and then there's this um, extra step that Dr. Tarbaton added, which means you, uh, in addition to putting the parameters, you just you put an environment here, and uh, and you've got to specify in this environment section that you want the North American Alba's equal area conic projection. And when you do that, I've verified that all the numbers work out correctly. And, uh, and I've also corrected the script after that to make sure the numbers that are in the script are the, are the correct ones. So I apologize for that mistake. That was my mistake. So you learn all kinds of things as you're going through this. This is the first time that we've <laughs> extracted data from the living atlas. And uh, I think this correction is going to apply to all extractions that come from the Living Atlas because all of them are in this Web Mercator system. So there's an important lesson that's, uh, that we've learned out of this is that if we're living, using the Living Atlas when you're doing extractions, then you have to project them um, to the Elvis Equal Area projection if you want to get area measurements made from them. I've changed the due date for this class for this um, exercise to Thursday, so it'll give you time to correct the solution. And it was Shazadur Rahman. Where's Shazadur? Yeah, he was the one who pointed out there was a mistake. So thank you, Shazadur, for doing that. Uh, and we want to make sure everything's correct. Okay. So I guess the same can go here if you guys uh, want to take till Thursday or Friday to, to do it. I think I said Friday in my email, so we will we'll go to Friday here. But well, it's only a small correction, so. <laughs> it's not really, yeah. yeah. It's only a small. But still, it's, well, we want to have things right. This is. Uh, there's no reason to have any mistakes here. This is, yes. So has that question been uploaded in the instructions? Yes, it has. Okay. Yeah. So anyways, I went through this morning and verified Dr. Tarbaton's adjustment, and then I've adjusted the instructions, and I put at the top, corrected 25th of September. So you'll know when you get the file, it's the correct one. OK, any other okay. questions about exercise two? Yes. So then our counts should match what's on the document? Yes, yeah, and the new. So I've gone through, and this, this, it 
recurs by the time you go through the several steps that involve counts. So I went through and updated the counts. As, uh, so if you could just go down a little bit further, David, um, and show them the subsequent steps here. Yeah, so there's a, there's a check here just to make sure that you've got the North American Albers Equal Area projection. Keep going. Um, then you've got the land cover. And I just retained the same nomenclature as before. And I've checked that all this comes out the same. And if you keep going, yeah. And so you've got this, the check is that you should have 17,291 cells for open water there. And yeah, if, if just. So, so if, you look at, uh, if you look at here in the, I've got, this is the old one, 22,953, mm -hmm. if you do it with Elvis. No, I've got 16, 16, 78. So I've got a different answer than yeah. you do. Apparently. Well, <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Uh, we, I, we tried both this morning and we got 17291. Okay, okay students here are confirming that 17291 is what they're getting. So I would uh, dismiss this one that I've got and it okay. probably should be rechecked. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I think everything is correct. I, I run a check on by adding up the total number of cells and it comes to 3,519 square kilometres as it should. And in fact, if you compare the cell area with the area that comes from the watershed, the acres on the watershed polygons, it's right on. You know, they're very, very close to each other. So everything works the way it should. Okay. Okay, so um, then, so moving on, uh, Today I'm going to introduce uh, exercise three, and I've got a couple of slides here to um, sort of overview it, and then we're going to jump into the, um, into the exercise. So we're going to be doing some of the slope calculations uh, <coughs> that we introduced last time by hand. Then we'll verify them using ArcGIS. We'll show how to automate that process uh, using uh, Model Builder. Then we'll move into spatial analysis of the same Marcus elevation and precipitation. So you'll see about projecting rasters. So there'll be some of this business of projecting that will hopefully clarify some of the issues that uh, were tripping us up with the national land cover data set. Examining and visualizing the topography. I'll probably skip over that because there's a lot of stuff to get through and that's fairly easy. Uh, zonal average calculations where you can average things for watersheds. And thesis and polygons, which is an approach for uh, calculating area average precipitation as well as using surface smoothing to average precipitation. So I've just put in a couple of slides from last time to bring to the fore of your mind uh, what slope and aspect is. So uh, slope is measured in terms of the rise divided by the run, and we'll be uh, calculating that. Um, if you, uh, and then aspect is measured um, counterclockwise from, from north, so if you've got a delta y change and a delta x change, you can use the tangent to figure out that angle. So if you're using the ArcGIS slope tool, it uh, basically takes the nine uh, grid cell values here that are labeled A through I, and it approximates a slope from A to C, it approximates a slope from D to F, and approximates a slope from G to I in the x direction. And then it uses a sort of a one to one weighting. So the, the slope from A to C is A minus C divided by two times the cell size. And if you use the one to one weighting, uh, you end up getting this formula for the slope in the x direction. Similarly, you can get the slope in the y direction. And uh, then the slope magnitude is evaluated with uh, this, which is basically Pythagoras' theorem. Uh, then to get the aspect, which is the slope direction, you take the component of the slope in the y direction, which I'm calling delta y, the component of the slope in the x direction, which we call delta x, and we use octan to figure out the angle. So those were uh, sort of covered uh, last time. You need to keep your wits about you with this angle and pay attention to these signs because there's an opportunity to be 180 degrees uh, degrees off. Uh, so look at the magnitude of the values and see which quadrant uh, you're in uh, when working that out. Um, so there was this, so here's the example slide that I
worked through last time where we put numbers. And if you look at the beginning of the homework exercise, you'll see I've given a, a different set of numbers and asked you to do hand calculations, basically where you plug quantities into these formulas, get the x and the y coordinates of slope, evaluate the magnitude, evaluate the arc tangent, uh, pay attention to uh, which, uh, well, th this is the arc tangent of the, the angle, the vertical angle. Um, take the arc tangent of the, the ratio of the two components and then uh, add 180 if needed to figure out that this is actually in this downwards direction. You can see it, see that because the x component, the 0.229 is positive. The y component, the minus 0.329 is negative, so it's positive to the, to, to the right, negative down. And if you just look at the elevation values, you'll see that you expect the, the downward slope where the water would flow to be going from 67 towards 48. The second way of calculating slope is um, to uh, basically just look at each of the neighboring cells and figure out if water was to go to one of them, which is the steepest downwards direction. You don't have to evaluate the ones that are higher in elevation, because water doesn't flow uphill. So you, your candidates are really just the 56, the 48, and the 52. And if you evaluate the slope 67 to 48, you get, uh, when you divide by the diagonal distance, 30 square root of, you've got 0.45. If you divide by the um, vertical distance, uh, or the north-south distance, you end up with 0.5. So this is a bigger value, so we would determine that the, the D8 uh, slope and flow direction is from the 67 to the 52, and the slope value is 0.5. We need a way to encode the fact that this is going directly down, and we use this set of numbers, 1, 2, 4, so that would be encoded as a value of 4. Um, so then, Sort of new for the exercise this year, I thought I would uh, subject you to calculating uh, the slope using the D-infinity algorithm because we can actually verify that uh, with ArcGIS because that functionality has just got built into ArcGIS. So um, the idea is basically to look at each one of these triangles, the 0, 1, 2 triangles, for example, and uh, you can calculate the component of the slope in the y direction is the elevation at point 1 minus the elevation at point 2 divided by the cell size. So that's a sort of a vertical slope down in the, in the y direction for this plane of this little triangle. In the x direction is the elevation of the slope from the center point to cell number 1. And then you can therefore get this angle by the octan of that ratio you can get the magnitude by those differences divided by whatever the cell size is and applying Pythagoras' theorem. Uh, so that'll get you uh, the angle and the slope. So putting numbers on it, here's what I did uh, in the class last time, showing you that with these same values, you end up getting uh, this angle of 14.9 degrees, which is actually an angle measured like that. But, depend, but because we happen to be in this triangle, you have to add, in this case, 270 to get a value of 284, and you can work out the magnitude of the slope. So for the data that I've given you in the, home, in the exercise, I'm also giving you a hint that uh, you only have to worry about this triangle. You don't have to worry about the other one. So I'm sort of shortcutting it uh, for you a little bit. Um, and the values that I'm referring to of, with Z5, Z6, and so on, are the elevations of cell number 5, the elevation of cell number 6, and the center cell, Z0, is this 26.4. So just working with the values 26.4, 26, and 25.8, plugging them into that formula, you can get this angle alpha, and you can get the magnitude of the slope, and you're going to have to add this alpha to... 180 to get the value that uh, will be the angle that uh, the infinity reports. So any questions? So there's that's the, the, the very first page of the 
homework exercise, let's get rid of exercise two, get rid of land cover corrections. Um, this uh, here says, given this grid of values, uh, calculate uh, by hand slope and aspect at cell location A. So any questions? Yes, there's a question here. Go ahead. The last part one slide. Okay, the, which the, the one about uh, the? Can you show the slide number ten from your previous? Nine. Nine. Slide number nine. The question about that. Okay, what's the question? Uh, here we are adding two seventy degrees. Uh huh. But in the next slide mm -hmm. we are adding one eighty degrees. Okay, so the question is, what's the, in the next how picture? You're saying, yeah. how do you know whether it's two seventy or one eighty or what? So um, the, con the, qu the, uh, the convention that we adopted was that uh, the angle was going to be measured uh, counterclockwise from zero as due east. So you're measuring an angle from zero round to uh, wherever the direction is. And um, in this case, you have to add 270 because the steepest slope was found in the triangle that's formed by E0, E7, and E8. So you basically have to examine, there's one, two, three, four, five, there's, there's eight triangles here. You have to examine the slope in each of those triangles and pick the steepest one. So the code is actually doing that. Um, and depending on which triangle has the steepest slope, you have to figure out what is the offset. In this case, the offset is 270 plus this 14.9. In this case, because it's this triangle, if you measure from east and come all the way around, you get to 180, and then you have to add this alpha angle. Mm -hmm. So um, it depends on which triangle uh, you're in as to what, what uh, increment you have to add. OK. And uh, in the previous two, uh, three slides, uh, previous one, mm -hmm. uh, then we're talking about the aspect. Mm -hmm. There, it was written that we need to move clockwise. Yes, so the, this is a completely different thing than aspect. So the question is, how does this angle relate to the aspect angle? So uh, it's, um, well, typically it's, uh, it's not the same thing. It's a different thing because it's only been evaluated based on these uh, three elevations, and it's uh, an approximation of where water might go downhill. When you're evaluating aspects, uh, let's go to uh, here, you're actually considering all of the cells surrounding um, a center cell and uh, fitting a sort of polygon type surface according to uh, basically this, uh, this set of concepts. Um, so it's really a different approximation that uses a, a different set of information um, and gives you a different answer. Now, now often the, the, the numbers are somewhat close, and what you learn from this exercise, you'll see how close they are and how far apart they are, and be able to comment on that and writing it up. Any other questions? Okay, let's go on then. So, um, so that's the, the bit by hand, and then we say, okay, verify this uh, using ArcGIS. So um, I have provided in um, the zip file that you can download, there's a elif.ascii file that, um, if I say open it with uh, a text editor, um, you'll see that these are exactly the same numbers that uh, were printed in the, in the exercise, but that can be pulled into ArcGIS and we can do those calculations. So I'm going to actually do that. So let's um, have a new blank project, uh, which I'm going to call, uh, let me first decide where I'm going to put it. Um, I'll put it in my exercise 
3 folder um, and call it exercise 3 slope um, uh, and um, I'm going to create a when it finally wakes up create a a new map part of it so and then I'm going to add this data from my download folder exercise 3 that little ASCII file that I showed you um, and when it eventually shows up so I'm going to basically zoom to this layer um, and there the individual values, I'm going to turn off the topographic, well, let me remove the topographic layer because it's sort of meaningless in this, in this context. Uh, and you can see these are the, the elevation values, the 26.4, 27, 26.1, 26, that correspond to uh, what, we had, uh, what we had here. So, uh, if I want to um, calculate, uh, well, I, in the in the example here, in the in the script here, I changed the symbology to something with red, um, but I can go through and calculate slope and aspect. So I'm not going to do all of them, but since the student there was asking about aspect, let me go and do aspect. So let me go into analysis with the tools active. Uh, and then in the toolboxes inside Spatial Analyst, um, we can find in the surface toolbox, I could, have, uh, I could have just typed aspect had I known that that's what the name of it was, but sometimes looking through these tools is helpful to learn what the tools are because you may not know what the, the keywords are to search for them. So. If I'm going to evaluate aspect for this, so I'm sort of skipping over the, the slope one because uh, applying these tools is pretty much all the same. I'm going to specify this as my input. Let's uh, specify an output um, as just, just a file called aspect, and I can go in that gear database and then if I run that tool, you'll see it did not evaluate quantities around the edge. And um, that's a good thing because uh, the aspect here is going to depend on the data that you don't know. So it's only evaluated these six cells in the middle. You can look at this one and you can see that the pixel value is 265.6. So you should be getting a hand calculation that's 265.6, and you can click on our uh, GIS and validate that. What direction is 265.6, if you were to draw a diagram? We're measuring clockwise from north. So you start from north, go all the way around to the east, all the way down to Go ahead. All the way down to the south. You'd be 270 going back directly to the west, so it's a little bit before that. So 265 is sort of down almost to the west, five degrees south of, uh, of west. Five degrees, so it's sort of uh, west-southwest, um, if you go by the, whatever those uh, conventions are, the points of the compass. So uh, that would be the, the, the aspect. Say we wanted to um, do the uh, D-infinity flow direction. So the, 
the exercise has you go through uh, aspect, slope, D8 flow direction, and D infinity flow direction, uh, and report results from all of them. So I'm going to go back to uh, the the D infinity flow direction is in the hydrology tool set. Now we're going to next class and the following one be uh, becoming very familiar with all of these, so you might want to take a sort of sneak peek at them, but if you take the flow direction tool, input the same raster, let's uh, switch to the infinity, uh, and let's uh, call it flow der, but um, let's put the uh, inf at the end of it, and for the drop raster, let's also put the result in the your database, percentage drop, uh, yeah. um, now, I'm, now I discovered uh, something um, while I was working on this exercise. There's written in the script here that you have to be careful with uh, grid file names that get longer than 13 characters. If you try and just put a grid file name outside of a geodatabase, just in the directory structure, it'll complain at you if you have more than 50 characters. If you're putting it in a geodatabase, it doesn't matter. It seems to take, well, it went as long as I went, which was 17 or 18. I didn't push it to a very long file name, but, but that limitation uh, seems to be overcome inside geodatabase. There's another possible reason to use those. So here I'm going to uh, actually calculate. Uh, so this is now the the RTIS result for uh, flow direction and percentage drop um, that's been calculated using the infinity. And we can look at this grid cell here, which corresponds to our grid cell A in our, um, in our scripts, which I uh, recall we are looking at uh, cell A was um, was this one, this, this sort of second one down. Um, if I click on that, it says uh, the percentage drop is 4.4%. Uh, um, but I want to actually uh, look at the individual values. A handy thing that I've actually been doing is going to put this explore and show all visible layers. Then when I click on a cell value, and expand this, I can see all of the values at once. We see the flow direction uh, from D infinity is 206 degrees. So is that far or close from this 265? How do those numbers compare? Yeah, 10 degrees different. 10 degrees. So how are you getting 10 degrees? Um, I subtracted. Well, it's uh, 206 is counterclockwise from east, so that means if you take off 180, you've got then uh, 26 degrees below the horizontal axis, and the other one was about 5 or 6 degrees below the horizontal axis, F still facing west, but slightly different. So that's how I came up with um, 10. So, that's, so, so you can't just say 265 minus 206 and mm -hmm. infer 60 because they're actually, uh, they, they measure with different conventions. This, mm -hmm. this aspect is uh, counterclockwise from north, so as he pointed out, it's 5 degrees south of west. This flow direction, I mean the aspect is clockwise from north. The flow direction is counterclockwise from east. So you start here, <laughs> you go up there 90, you go up there 280, and then you go down another uh, 26, so that's 200, that's um, 26 degrees south of west. So 26 degrees south of west versus 6 degrees south of west. So they're more or less in the same direction. So one of the messages is, is that in this case, the, the flow direction and the aspect give you more or less the same direction, not exactly the same, because they're different methods. And I think one is more appropriate for perhaps saying where water would flow, and the other one might be more appropriate for, say, solar illumination, where you want to consider all of the cells around it. So, um, 
the section 1.2 of the exercise has you uh, evaluating all of those and making a, a little table uh, with um, the values of this cell and this cell to uh, uh, just report, report them. Now, it might get tedious to do all of this by hand repeatedly, so uh, we are going to use uh, Model Builder to um, speed that up. Um, so I'm going to, so that's what uh, section 1.3 uh, of the exercise is about. So if you go into the catalog tab of your project and you look at uh, where it says toolboxes, you see that every project has its own toolbox. If I click on this expand, it's empty, but I can actually right click on here and say I want a new model. And now what it's done is it's, uh, it's hidden my map. My map is still underneath this tab here. There's a new tab here that's model, and this is a blank slate. And this is where I can go and start uh, putting together the tools that I want to uh, effectively um, run a lot of these calculations in sequence. So I'm going to go back and find in the geoprocessing uh, tab a tool that I want. And to have a consistent set of data to work with, I'm actually going to use this conversion tool, which is um, from ASCII to raster. And that's because my uh, data set is in ASCII, and I want to get it in a raster format that I can link to all of the other tools uh, that I want. So I can just grab any tool from over here and drag it and drop it on my screen. So now I'm sort of building up a flowchart. So this is a sort of visual way of doing computer programming. Um, and uh, I can then double click on the, the sort of rectangles refer to the tools, the ovals refer to uh, the inputs or outputs. I can double click on this one and I can say, okay, I want the input file to be uh, um, the input ASCII file, which I have to find where that is on my computer, and I've got it in the downloads folder for exercise three. Um, and uh, I can specify where I want the output to be, to go, and I'm going to let it go into the same slope uh, geodatabase. I'm going to uh, name it... Uh, um, L of M, and I'm putting the, the subscript or the last letter M after everything to uh, indicate that this is the value that comes from the model. I'm going to click Save that. Um, you might have remembered that the data values we were dealing with, some of them were decimal points, so floating point numbers. So I should say it's floating point data, otherwise I'll end up truncating the numbers. I don't want that. So now it's actually uh, colored these things in. So when you see a a model builder diagram that has uh, the icons colored in, that means it's properly connected, it's, uh, it's ready to go. So this uh, is a sort of beginnings of a model that will take input from this file and output a uh, raster um, that's called L of M. And then I can go and uh, do some of the other things I was doing. So we were calculating flow direction. So I take this flow direction uh, tool, I drop it on my screen, I can now go and connect these things together. So the way you do that is just by clicking and dragging. So I'm going to click on L of M and drag an arrow and just release when I'm over the flow direction. When I release it shows up input surface raster. It says that input that I've just connected, which how should it be interpreted? I want to interpret that as the input surface raster, so I select that. Now this got filled in because it's actually uh, um, has, it, has, has its value, um, it's got the inputs it needs, and I can um, double click on this tool again, and I can adjust the file names if I want. So uh, I want to actually have the flow direction, uh, I'm just going to name it flow der, der um, 
And the drop raster, I'm going to name it uh, okay. Percentage drop. Um, and uh, I'm leaving this as D8 because we actually want uh, both D8 and the uh, infinity from this uh, from this work. So I'm going to click OK. So now I've got a model sort of started to be built, built up where I've got uh, these things connected together. I can actually at this point uh, save. It's always good to save in case we get a crash. Um, I can actually click on this button at the top where it says run and uh, run the model. And uh, if you watch very carefully, and I don't know whether it will happen on this going over the video, you'll see some of these flash red when each one is processing. Um, I saw you hit the, pro the save, uh, save project save button instead of the save one that's there in the model builder tab. If you save the project, will it also save the model updates or will those be lost if you were to close it and reopen? I'm hoping that it saved. <laughs> I don't actually haven't validated that. So I'm going to hit save here just to be sure. <laughs> uh, you can go ahead and try it out and see what... Uh, um, so I'm suspect, I'm suspecting if we just do this save, it might only save the model. But if I do this save, hopefully it saves everything. Um, so I'm going to click Run. OK, there, this one flashed red, that one flashed red. And uh, now this message says processing is complete. And so I can close it. I can go back to Catalog here and where I had databases and this but sometimes you actually have to uh, do refresh over here so you right click on the database and go to where it says refresh and now it's added the results that were calculated by that uh, model execution so I've got floater the floater dnf was there before percentage drop the percentage drop the infinity was there before so I ran all those things um, in sequence so what the exercise has you go through is go and build up, uh, uh, um, build up all of the things that we want to do. Um, it can get kind of messy on the screen here. So there is this handy auto layout button, which will sort of rearrange things for you. Um, and I can go back to geoprocessing and some of the other things I want to do also do the model is uh, from the, I guess, the surface tool set, I want to calculate aspect. I want to calculate slope. Um, I want both of those to take inputs from this elevation. Uh, this to take inputs from that elevation. I want to specify my outputs uh, to be... Uh, Things like uh, slope from the model, and I want my slope to be in uh, percent rise. So that's an important thing. We were comparing, we were doing the hand calculations with percent rise. Make sure you are consistent here, otherwise you get degrees, and uh, the numbers won't be exactly the same. Uh, and aspects. I'm specifying, uh, I'm going to just put the name uh, aspect from the model. Um, I can actually auto lay it, layout, it gets kind of organized nicely. And to be complete the way that um, I'd set it up in the exercise, we also want the D infinity flow direction. So I'm going to add another flow direction. Uh, tool, I'm going to connect it to my elevation data, um, and I'm going to go into this one, and I'm going to set this to be uh, the D-infinity method. I'm going to set the output to be floater D-inf from the model, and uh, this output to be um, Uh, 
um, percentage drop. Ian, now I've actually been paying attention uh, to not uh, collide with any names that I of, of rosters that I have there already. So I, that's why I've been putting the M at the end of the names to be specifying something different. If I forgot to do that and I left it the same, like say I, say I don't do that, and I do save, you'll end up with this little warning sign that uh, is, is telling you that um, there's, a, there's a name collision and uh, when you try to run the model, it then might, might overwrite it. So you may get that uh, depending on how you're naming things. I'm going to name it uh, without that, and, um, and then we won't have that issue. You'll also get that warning immediately after you've run a tool, because the tool is then often still on the, on the screen, but now the output exists. So uh, you, that, that's effectively a warning for if you were to run the tool again. Um, so you have to, that's a, something to just pay attention to. So I'm going to click OK here and auto lay, lay out. So now I've got a model that uh, is, is ready to evaluate uh, everything uh, that uh, we need to do in this uh, sort of model builder part of the, um, the, part of the exercise. Um, let me, here I'm going to just save it for this button. So now in theory the model is saved, but probably the project's not. Um, and I'm going to run it, and you'll see some of these things are flashing as it goes through. Um, and it's uh, completed, and I could actually go uh, and um, refresh this geodatabase. I can see all of the um, new results have been added. So the, one of the things we ask you to hand in is uh, just a screenshot of uh, your model like this after you've assembled it all together, because here you've, without really uh, being trained in programming, you have now programmed a sequence of ArcGIS tools to, uh, to be able to, um, to do this work. So you, you're starting to get some automation, which is uh, really pretty handy. Um, you can make it even better, and the last thing we'll do with it is we'll actually make it a general tool that can work on any set of data and run it with um, a different set of inputs. So you can click on any one of the files, either one of these output ones or the input ones, and say right click and say make this a parameter of this model. So I set this to be a parameter. That means it's going to allow it to be um, something you can specify something else for the input. Um, and it puts a little P next to it. I'm going to go next to these other ones and all these outputs are going to make it a parameter. And I'm also going to say, add the result to the display. So that'll say that when it's completed, it must add it to the display. We noticed that it wasn't adding the result to display immediately when I was running it previously. So I'm going to quickly go through and uh, do that on all of these. Uh, parameter, add to display, parameter add to display, parameter, add to display, parameter, add to display. Um, I can also go uh, and change the name of uh, my model to something uh, perhaps more descriptive than model. We don't know what the model does. We know that this model is actually calculating uh, flow direction, so maybe I want to right click on its properties and there's actually a model name and a model label. I'm not quite sure why there's two of them. Flow, let's say I call it flow direction and let me just also put the label as flow direction. Um, and uh, so uh, there um, I don't know why it hasn't updated there. Maybe it will eventually. Um, maybe I have to save it. Yeah, if I save it, it the, the name changes there. So now I've got this set up as a tool, uh, um, and uh, it could, it's, it's in this uh, exercise three uh, slope toolbox, um, 
and uh, it can take all of these things as parameters. So, and I believe I saved everything. So I'm, I'm now actually going to close uh, ArcGIS and open it again. Um, and uh, work with uh, a new set of, uh, set of data. So the last little bits on, I guess, page 19 or 20 of this is I'm still working with this uh, exercise three slope project. I, want, I have to work with that project because that's the project where my tool is in, the, in, that, in that geodatabase. Let me uh, close this over there. I probably should have done that first. Let me also um, close this map and uh, insert a new map into the project. Um, and now I'm just going to go to my model and I'm going to double click on this tool. Just like I would double click on any other Esri tool. Um, and now it'll open up and now it's looking for uh, parameters to be input. So I can go and I can find uh, that um, I, I actually provide a different data set in that folder in the zip file, this demo ASCII data set. We don't know exactly what that looks like yet, but I can uh, just specify this as the input. And for the outputs, um, I could go and uh, change these names uh, and maybe I want to do that. Uh, to uh, just keep them separate from the other results I had. Um, and I think I probably could have run the model and overwritten the results. Um, and now I'm going to run. So now um, it's actually running that entire model in the background. You don't see a lot of progress except for this, uh, this thing at the bottom here, where it says it, what it's executing each, uh, each component. Um, uh, it completed successfully. It added a whole bunch of things to the screen. Um, and if we uh, zoom to wherever that is, you'll see we've got some results. So here is the percentage drop. That's effectively the slope that's been calculated using uh, the infinity. Um, if I turn that off, the one underneath that I see is the, the D infinity flow direction, which looks very, in, very similar to uh, hill shades. The values range from 0 to 359. I guess it's an angle again, 0 all the way around basically to 360. Uh, you can get the percentage drop from uh, the D8 approach. The D8 flow directions, which are these numbers 1 up to 128, so discrete values here. And then here you've got the slope from uh, the, the surface fitting, the slope tool, and the aspect from uh, the, the ESRI tool. So there's um, six different uh, things that you get just from running that model. So there you have it. Model build is a really uh, useful thing for automating uh, workflows. If you, if you find yourself having to repeat this uh, or, or any other process, you can use model builder to, uh, to help with that. Any questions before I go on to the elevation and precipitation part? OK. So Dr. Yeah. Tarleton there, just, so, could you just show the digital elevation model itself, David, that you used? Okay, just, so... Just turn off everything down to the bottom there. I guess it must come up. It didn't actually get loaded. Ah. Um, so apparently, that's because it only loaded... I didn't, I didn't specify add to map for that output on my model. Uh -huh. But I can easily add it. It happens to be that one. Yeah, so this is a new elevation model data that's much more complex than the first one that Dr. Tarleton was working with. 
and the intent here. Is this somewhere near Utah or? Oh, let's see if it's at all close. Uh, uh, <laughs> Belgrade. <laughs> it thinks it's in Romania. <laughs> so, um, this data is actually from uh, the Mai Mai catchment in New Zealand. Ah, there you go. Uh, but uh, its uh, projection information is not supplied as part of the, the ASCII file. So, it's, when, it, when it tries to interpret those uh, numerical values in whatever the, the map projection is here, which will no doubt be Web Makeda, it puts it in uh, this part of uh, Romania. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we should, yeah, the, um, the topographic map is not a meaningful point to take out. Yeah, the point I was trying to draw out is that Dr. Tabaton is using the same model on a different data set than the one he had earlier. And indeed, the same process can be used on any, any elevation data set. It doesn't have to be just arbitrary ones like what you see here. So in a minute, when we, uh, we could actually keep this model handy and use it on the, uh, on the San Marcos if we, uh, when we do the rest of the exercise, if you want to add to that. So maybe I'll do that um, when we get there. So the next part of the exercise was going to um, be uh, looking at the, the, the San Marcos Basin. Um, so I was going to start that as a, um, as a, new, uh, a new ArcMap project, so, um, or Arc Pro project. Um, how do I... Where do I get? Yeah, if you just... So... Uh, so I'm going to go with a new blank project. And I was going to also put this um, in the same exercise 3 folder. And I was going to call it exercise 3 project, you can name it whatever you like, but this is the name we used preparing the exercise, so I'm trying to be somewhat consistent. Um, and uh, I didn't, uh, I'm going to add the data slightly differently. There is actually an ability to go to um, where, so, um, to go to connections and add a database. So I provided a San Marcos uh, geodatabase in the zip file that's very similar to the one that you uh, worked on in exercise two. Um, so uh, if you add a geodatabase, that's another way of associating a geodatabase <coughs> with a project rather than adding individual uh, layers. So, um, so the method in the madness is showing you different ways of doing uh, similar sort of things. So I'm going to click this geodatabase and say OK to that. So um, now if I uh, look at this um, the databases, you'll see that there's the one that was created with the project and the San Marcos geodatabase both belong to, um, to this project. Then I can look inside the San Marcos geodatabase, and there's a base map feature data set already, I can right click on that and say add to a new map. So this is a different way to effectively create a map in my project. My project right now doesn't have a map. So if I do that, it's now opening a new map and it's importing all of these, uh, these layers. So we see we've got the outline of the San Marcos Basin, which maybe I want to have symbolized uh, let me get it to where I can have the color perhaps be our favorite green. Um, and I've got sub-watersheds located here. And maybe I'm also going to have those be uh, transparent with a, a sort of grayer outline. 
Um, maybe I want it a bit darker so I can actually find them. Uh, and uh, I've got some precipitation gauges at the, um, let me go with a brighter color for them. I mean, it's clean gauges, and then the blue dots are precipitation gauges. So uh, that's, the, that's the data for this, and they all got uh, loaded up here um, automatically um, when I did that add from map. Um, you can actually look at the properties of some of them, and uh, let's look at the, the properties associated with gauges. And if you look at source and down here, if we find spatial reference, we'll see that uh, we're working in uh, an ALBA's uh, projection. So, so, so one of the things we, we were doing here is working in a consistent uh, coordinate system. So um, I was going to... Uh, get uh, elevation data for this watershed from the um, National Elevation data set. But again, I'm going to be using uh, the Living Atlas. So I put a bit of guidance in the, in the homework script. So let's find, because I wanted you guys to be a little bit aware of um, the how one might know that this is a good data set to use. So if you actually went to um, the Living Atlas in a browser, um, and uh, perhaps you did a search on elevation, um, you can find, so these are all of the, the things that um, are part of the ESRI um, Living Atlas system. And you can scroll through these and sort of assess them based on their credibility, who supplied them, and what they actually are. Uh, tinted elevation hill shade. Well, that could be cool, but it's not exactly what we want. We want the raw data. Ground surface elevation. This is the one we want. It's 30 meter raster data extracted from USGS's national elevation data set. So you can find other, th other things for Kentucky at five feet. So Maybe if you work in Kentucky, that's a useful resource. There's an elevation coverage map for other parts of the world. World uh, at 250 meter resolution, topobathy layers. Um, so you can actually look at the information on this. And here's where um, it uh, explains what it is. Um, it explains that this is... Uh, actually using the North American Alba's Equal Area conic projection. So the web map services don't always use um, the, the web Mercator. This one is actually using uh, an Equal Area conic projection. So when we download it, it will already be in this projection. And it's doing the resampling from the native data in geographic coordinates. And that's what it's explaining, explaining over here. So uh, now that you know a little bit about the data, we can actually add data from Living Atlas, and in those we can search the portal for elevation, um, and uh, I wanted to go to the web page because I couldn't find a way to get all of that information about the data set I was loading in this little add data dialog. So. I want to know more about what I was at. I was actually getting a, a good one. Um, so I'm going to click OK. And uh, now the elevation data has been added. And because it spans the whole of the, the US, the values are pretty large, from minus 450 to 8,700. I'm not sure where there's a mountain that's that high in the US, but. Uh, um, might be going up to Mount McKinley or something like that. Um, anyway, so for this little part of Texas, that's all going to be in one of these uh, colors of black, so we get the not very attractive um, sort of background there. Um, now I'm going to actually use the uh, 
similar to the extract by mask function that we used before, but to isolate on the watershed. But when I'm doing DEM work, it's always good to have a little buffer around the edge. So I'm going to use um, a... Was there a question there? No, we're good. Okay. So I'm going to use the uh, buffer tool. Um, and uh, so let's see. So if we go into geoprocessing, look for buffer. That's, I guess, one of the common ones. So it's even amongst the defaults. Um, and uh, I'm going to select the input feature class as my basin, the output feature class, basin buffer. I need to probably pay attention to where that goes. So I'm going to save that in the, um, in the databases, San Marcos database. Maybe I want to put it in the base map. So let me call this basin buffer. Click on save. And um, I'm going to go with 2,000 meters and run this tool. And uh, so now we see that there's a, a little buffer around that. So uh, now um, there's also, uh, so, so now I want to extract the, um, the ground surface elevation just for that. Uh, for that part, um, and the function that I want to use to doing that is, is clip. So I'm actually on page 28. So I'm going to actually open another tool, find clip here, um, and you can actually read about each of these. This. This one, if you hover over it, it says cut out a portion of a raster data set. The analysis tools extract input features. So the raster data set one is the one that I want. Um, and uh, so I'm going to use that. And there I can see uh, that it's going to be sort of doing the thing that I want if I read that. Help information. My input is the ground surface elevation that's from the a living Atlas web service. The output extent, I want to be my basin buffer. Um, and I'm going to call the result. I'm going to just put it in the San Marcos Geo database. And I'm going to just put it, call it San Marcos DEM. And uh, did I want to say anything else uh, for that? I think. Um, that was all, so now I can run. Um, so now what it's actually doing is it's uh, sampling this, this huge data set that covers the, the whole of the US and just extracting the part that's going to be the rectangle that's, uh, that's bounded by the extent of the, this buffer area. So uh, there we've got these DMs, and now we can actually turn this. Uh, David, um, before you pass off from that, can you just look at the coordinate system of the data that you use, the ground service elevation? North America, Alba is equal era conic. Okay, there you go. So we're all, that, yeah, that we're all, was consistent yep. with... Uh, what we discovered wherever, what we saw in the, in the help file about this uh, living atlas uh, layer. The image service uses that. So, I mean, some of the discussion I was having with uh, Charlie was what, uh, what the land cover data set said here, and he actually pointed out that he thought the documentation was incorrect. Because I said, well, the way it's written the documentation, it should actually do something. Yeah, well, contact um, Esri people and get it fixed. <laughs>
Well, he said he's just down the hall from them, so he's going to sort it out. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so if we look at the spatial reference of this uh, San Marcos one, we should uh, see it's also the North American Albers Equilibrium conic. So, so we've actually got a a good projection uh, to work with. But these parameters here are different than the parameters if I say look at uh, my um, look at 96, 20, 60, 40. If I look at my basin here um, and its spatial reference, uh, wherever that is, um, it's a different, it's a NAD 83 Albers. It's minus 96, 29.5, 45.5, 37.5. So it's the same uh, projection framework, but different uh, uh, coordinate system parameters. Um, so uh, later on this exercise, we'll actually project from what we got from the, the web service onto uh, the same, uh, same system. So we've got everything consistent. And the difference between them is that uh, the one that we've been using for the San Marcos Basin applies to the contiguous United States, and the other one applies to the whole North American continent, including Alaska. That's why the, um, the two parallels are further apart in the projection for the elevation data than they were for the San Marcos Basin. So in fact, that's the very next uh, step that we have to do. So. If I, um, the tool that I want to do that with is project, and it's this project raster tool. So if I open that, um, I'm, the input is going to be my San Marcos DEM. The output I'm going to just uh, call it uh, projected uh, DEM. Um, is that what I called it? Yeah. And now I want to specify that the output coordinate system should be the same as, say, my basin. And now it'll pick that NAD 83 Albers one. I could actually hover over it and you can see the parameters in this little projection string that are popping up on the screen. Um, when you're doing projection of rasters, you have to pay attention to what the resampling technique is. Nearest neighbor is not a good method for floating point values. Uh, last time we spoke a little bit about using bilinear. Today I'm going to use cubic convolutions. So that's an even sort of greater smoothing of the surface. And I can actually choose what my output cell size is. And I'm going to say that it must be exactly 30 meters. Um, and I execute that tool. So uh, that will um, effectively convert the DEM. You won't notice any uh, visual difference uh, because it, was a, it covers the same, the same extent. But you'll see that the, the values on the legend here are slightly different. Went from 0.48 to 0.51 and 0.41 to 0.76. So in terms of the smoothing and the resampling, the the bound values have changed uh, a little bit. Um, so you have actually uh, degraded the data. And that's one of the things you have to just be careful with when you work with DEMs. If you project them too many times, every time you do a projection, you're, you're degrading the, the data from its, from its original um, piece of information. Um, there's some sections through here that I'm going to skip over because uh, we're running a bit short of time. But there's exploring the digital elevation model, basically putting a nice symbology on it and finding the highest value in it, uh, putting contours on it, putting a hill shade on it that are fairly uh, straightforward. What I want to jump ahead to is calculating the zonal average. Because we, uh, we may be interested in, if we're running a hydrologic model, something like the average elevation for each of our, our watersheds. And uh, here we've got our, our, our sub-watersheds that are these, uh, these gray, um, gray things here. Let me just, uh, 
I will change the symbology so that they stand out a little bit um, better. So let's go with uh, that sort of topography. So there we've got high elevations down to low elevations, and we've got sub-watersheds. Uh, and we want to get, say, the average elevation for each of those. Um, we can actually label these sub-watersheds. And if I go to labeling properties, and I say that the thing that I want to label is not the site name. I want to use Hydra ID. So if I double click on that, I can say that the, the thing I want to label is Hydra ID. And uh, then if I label it, I've got these numbers, 331, 332, 333. Those are going to be the unique numbers that we use to associate things with uh, each of these uh, sub-watersheds. And I'm going to now go and do um, a zonal uh, statistics calculation. So if I go to geoprocessing and look at the list of the tools, um, toolboxes and find uh, where, where am I? So find spatial analyst. Yeah, if you just type zonal stats at the top, it'll find it, won't you? I could have done that, mm -hmm. sure. So there, zonal statistics as a table. Um, so I'm going to now uh, look at uh, my raster the input raw, the zone data is defined by sub-watershed. I want to use Hydro ID. The value raster, I want to use the projected DEM. The output table, I'm going to call it just uh, zone elev. And I'm going to just leave it in my uh, geodatabase there. And I'm going to have output uh, um, output uh, statistics, I'm going to go with all of them, and I'm going to uh, run that, and uh, now we will see if I open this table, I've got, um, so say with each Hydra ID, I've got all of these quantities, mean, this is mean of elevation, the standard deviation of the elevations, the range of the elevation, the maximum and the minimum, and things like that. So those might be quantities that you would want to want to extract. Um, I've got to where I'm just about at the end of time. So I think that uh, the zonal statistics part is, is fairly straightforward. The challenging part of this exercise is actually um, calculating precipitation using decent polygons. So I think I'll introduce that at the beginning of the class next time before I go into the sort of watershed delineation for that exercise. So I'll say this is uh, to be continued, but you should be able to work on this uh, at least to the end of part five by what we've had right now. Okay. Thank you very much then, David. Question. And if I'm clever enough, I can manage to save this before I walk out of the classroom and then I know where to start at the same place. Okay, I think we're good. Thank you so much for your help. Thank you.